Okay, folks, it's 2.40. I think it's time to start this talk because we have a lot to cover and I don't want to waste too much time on that. So uh, uh, without further ado, this is the talk about Java migrating to 11 in real application uh, or upper version, of course. Um, who am I? My name is Piotr Przybył. I'm self-employed as remote freelance software gardener. If you don't know who software gardener is, it's a person who takes care of a software as if it was a garden, meaning taking uh, some weeds out, getting rid, rid of bugs, planting new plants, new features, uh, sometimes uh, doing greenfield and so on and so on. Uh, you can say you hate uh, here or here uh, or feedback, uh, if you will. Um, <coughs> Uh, what's important is that I'm doing Java for 15 years, not only Java. I would say I would do 80% of, uh, of my professional activity is uh, Java developer. also do some Scala and, and Groovy. Uh, I'm mainly backend and uh, like almost 100% Linux and Unix. And I'm so deeply involved in Scala that it's, as you can see, it's even chasing me when I'm on holiday. Um, I already know who you are because we did a little voting just before. So uh, agenda for today. Uh, we'll cover crucial non-technical changes. Uh, we'll talk about remove and deprecated stuff. And uh, finally, how to run your application you currently have on Java 11. What we are not going to cover is all this new fancy stuff like new RPs, uh, var or tools and everything. So if you came for Java goodies, this is not going to happen uh, during this talk. Let's do one more voting. Who's running Java post 8 already? Okay, who's running Java 8? Yeah, so this talk is for you. Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay, Oracle JDK versus OpenJDK. This has been known for years that if you need to install Java, you go to Sun Microsystems page or Oracle page, uh, whatever it is, like javaoracle.com or whatever, and you grab Oracle JDK, you install it, and you run it, and you're fine to go. Uh, but there's also a thing called OpenJDK. Who knows OpenJDK? Who's using OpenJDK? OK, I would say not even a half. OK, so both are maintained by Oracle Corporation. All oh, right? Uh, and in functional aspect, at functional level, they are equal almost 100%, I would say. There are some cases, some corner cases, when I've heard it, they are not working equally, uh, although I didn't catch such a case on my own uh, so far. So technically, they're equal. I mean, if you compile your Java program using Oracle JDK, you can run it safely using OpenJDK and vice versa. There's not such, such an issue. However, there's one key difference between them. This one is open source, and this one isn't free, okay? You, meaning you need to uh, pay for it, to, to, to run it in, in production. Who has ever read uh, the license for uh, Sun or uh, Oracle's Java? Okay, nobody. Nobody, okay. It also was paid before that. I mean, before uh, Java 8, uh, there were some situations in which we had to pay for running Java programs or for running JVM. We just didn't read that, so we didn't know that. But now we have to pay in production for Oracle JDK uh, per HCPU core or CPU or, or something like this. And we don't have to pay for Open JDK. <coughs> There's a new release schema. Uh, so a uh, new major release of Java is released six months, every six months, Pre pretty much like Ubuntu. So uh, they are not waiting for features anymore. We are not observing the situation like, okay, we want to sh ship something uh, extra with Java, so let's wait a tiny little bit. This is not going to happen. This is not happening. So if it meets uh, the timeline, it's uh, shipped. If it doesn't, it has to wait for next releases, like uh, raw strings in Java 12. Uh, they didn't reach uh, this version, which is like really bad news for me. Um, Oracle releases JDK as long-term support version every three years. That's why Java 11 is long-term support for Oracle's JDK. Uh, and uh, for Open JDK, from Oracle's point of view, uh, there's an instant lack of support when a new version, new major version of Java is released. Meaning, when Java released, uh, sorry, when Oracle released Open JDK 12, or Java 12 was released, they instantly stopped supporting uh, uh, Open JDK in version 11. 
meaning you had to switch to 12 or use an update, outdated uh, insecure or potentially insecure uh, software. <coughs> and uh, I brought, uh, sorry, I borrowed this uh, slide from Azul, from Simon Ritter. Uh, so as you can see, we are like more or less here. And for uh, Java 8, this is public support, this is commercial support, and this is extended commercial support. So for Java 8, we don't have any more public support from Oracle. Uh, and these are the steps I was uh, referring in a previous slide, meaning that, that for OpenJDK, you have this uh, no public updates called support cliff. Like when the new version of Java is released, like when they release Java 13, Java 12 is not going to be supported as OpenJDK by Oracle. <coughs> okay? And uh, to get this long term support, you need to pay to get this extended support uh, or this commercial support from Oracle. All right? So th this gray or gray is boxes are, are free. These are paid. Uh, but we need to remember that there are also other vendors and other JVMs. There's uh, Red Hat, there's Azul, there's uh, IBM, uh, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Pivotal, uh, other companies uh, maybe as well. Um, and also there's kind of a consortium code called Adopt OpenGDK, meaning that when uh, OpenGDK reaches this support cliff, uh, it's not abandoned, I mean, it's kind of captured by them, so they uh, maintain it, they add uh, security backports and so on and so on. So de facto, this gets extended, all right? And now you can repeat after me, because there are lots of these people, you know, they believe in that the Earth is flat. They tell you that you should be wearing a tinfoil hat just to be protected from cosmic radiation, you know? High gain antenna, low gain antenna. And they keep telling that Java 11 is paid. This is rubbish, okay? I believe people who say that Java 11 is pay, paid, uh, or they, uh, you know, take part in these discussions in forums, they are wearing tinfoil hats. Because this is the level of this discussion. Java 11, my friends, is not paid, so you can repeat it after me. Java 11 is not paid. Louder, Java 11 is not paid. Once more, louder, Java 11 is not paid. Remember that and stop wearing tinfoil hats. Java is still free. You can refer to this link if you're interested. Why, why is it so? So uh, you can get uh, Adopt Open JDK. You can install it uh, using uh, Docker, various operating systems, or Windows, if you will. Uh, no problem with that. Uh, so. Do you recognize this slogan? Right ones run everywhere. Yeah, so when I started working with Java, it was Java 1.3 15 years ago, and then I even backported some code to Java 1.2. This was the famous, sl famous slogan from Sun, right ones uh, run everywhere. In practice, it worked like this. Right ones debug everywhere. This, is, this was the reality, okay? We know that. Uh, <coughs> so Oracle claims that with introduction of Java 9 and so forth, normal Java standard edition applications should just work. However, there are these two caveats, normal, so what's normal, what's not, and should. And beside that, there's this third one, third gotcha, standard edition. Okay, so if you have anything like from this Java EE or Java Jakarta EE, it might not work, just like that. Uh, in all other cases, the migration might not be a simple single step. And this talk is about this. Uh, so how to convince the business? Let's be realistic for a moment. If you'd like to do something, you need to get the budget, you need to get the time, the manpower, and so on. So before you start actually migrating, you need to convince someone to give the money and the time for that, right? So uh, in my opinion, uh, there are f at least a few valid arguments uh, um, or benefits from migrating to Java 11. I use them, they work, here they are. Uh, first, Java Flight Recorder, uh, Java Mission Control. So with re really li little overhead, just one or two percent in production, you can record what's happening under the hood. Uh, Java Flight Recorder uh, has been known for previous versions of Java as well, but due to this release schema and so on, uh, Oracle decided to open source it, meaning now you can use uh, JFR for free with OpenJDK, for instance. Uh, string has byte. I mean, they are no longer 
there's, there's no longer character array in strings, but byte array in strings. Plus one integer flag to indicate wh whether these bytes are uh, using, uh, or which version of UTF should be used, uh, or uh, better said, because this was the problem that many of our applications are running in English or Western languages, and we can represent each character as a single byte, right? So there's no point in wasting two bytes per each character, okay? Even if your name is Stepan, it will work. Unless you're made, named Pavel, then for the last character, for L, we need to use two bytes for this character. Therefore, the whole string uh, has, uh, uh, for Pavel, we have uh, five characters, meaning 10 bytes. And for uh, Piotr, we have uh, uh, five characters, but five bytes, because we don't have any non-English characters. I mean, simply speaking. Uh, this application class data sharing. So if you're worried about your uh, boot up time or startup time, you can increase it greatly. I think with Java 12, it's even enabled by default, meaning that when you start your application and, and, and JVM has to read all these jars and build this, you know, uh, where each class is, how it was loaded, security managers, and so on, this whole structure has to be built every time you start Java. Now with application class data shari sharing, you can just dump it and then it's, it can be reused using the, the next time you start uh, your application, provided you don't change your class path. So it's, it's faster, it's simpler to use. <coughs> and uh, there's also better integration with containers. As uh, David said uh, a few sessions ago, uh, Java is um, now more aware of the uh, constraints of Docker and, and other containers as well. And other big changes, in my opinion, are uh, Java unified logging. Finally, there's a unified way to log the internals, what's happening in Java or in Java uh, mission, virtual machine, what is what's happening under the hood when you're running it. Uh, of course, Java platform module system slash jigsaw, JShell, finally, Java has a repo. There's introduction of var, which I remind you is not a keyword, because you can have like var var equals Tommy which means var is not a keyword. And finally, we can write scripts in Java. I hope we'll have time to show you that. And finally, Java is removing stuff, or they are removing stuff from, from, from Java. And I think this is cool, because finally, like many other technologies or languages, like Perl, Python, C Sharp, or .NET, or whoever, they are just creating new versions which are not backward compatible which was kind of a burden, in my opinion, for uh, evolution of, of Java uh, as a platform, as a language, as a whole. So now they are finally decided that, OK, we, we're not we stopped this deprecating only. Now we are removing this stuff. Uh, so let's talk about this removed stuff. Uh, they uh, the, the couple, the, uh, this, was, this is the name of a module, right? Java Standard Edition, Enterprise Edition. So who's using SOAP or XML? Still, ah, uh, still many folks like web services and the kind, right? Okay, so uh, you will need to take care of this. Uh, I'll show you how uh, because this uh, this was the part of the GVM. Now it's not. Uh, it got decoupled. Uh, these uh, these libraries, these tools. Uh, who's using Corba? Uh, I was also using Corba. Now I can't because uh, it got removed from Java. It's not even decoupled as far as I know, it got removed. Sorry for you. Uh, JavaFX got also decoupled, applets, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, decoupled and applets are gone. Applets are no more, sad news for you browser fans. And there's also no Java web start, and many XX parameters were removed. There were about 800 in Java 8, and now there's slightly more than 500 as far as I know in Java 11 or 12. So they, of course, added a few, but they also removed a, v a vast number of, of uh, unneeded parameters. Uh, who's using Sun, Misc, and Safe and its methods? OK, one guy. You're, OK, you're brave. You get the jellies, OK? You get jellies. OK, who's using Spring? Keep your hands raised. Who's using Hibernate? OK, you guys are using Sun, Misc, and Safe too. Only you are not aware of this. So might be that your application will not simply run when you, when you try to start it or run it on JVM 11. Uh, there's much more, of course. The whole lists are here. So we, you're, you're like welcome to, to check them, what exactly got removed. And there's also duplicated stuff. Uh, a thing called Enhanced deprecation has been introduced. And what does it mean in practice? There is a new annotation 
with the capital or big D, and it has an optional parameter for removal, and it can be set as a true. Which means, if you have a piece of code annotated just like this, it will get removed in the next major release of Java. It will be gone. There will be no more this code. It will be deleted, okay? So this is like a difference from this small d deprecated because we didn't know. Deprecated meant like, oh, you should better not use it or will they remove it? We weren't sure. It was kind of a Schrodinger uh, annotation, right? Now we know it's going to be removed, deprecate, deprecated, uh, and deleted. Uh, you can, if you can't compile the code because you don't have the code, you only have binaries like jars, you can use jdeprscan uh, tool to find out if any uh, deprecated uh, API calls are going to be removed from Java next release. Uh, concurrent Max, Mark Sweep got uh, deprecated, Nas Horn got deprecated. And in my opinion, this is just my reading, it's not an official statement from Oracle or anyone else, uh, deep reflection got also deprecated, meaning uh, that you are, you know, constructing the name of the class or just grabbing an object and then you are calling this set accessible true, right? So when you need set accessible true, de facto you're doing so-called deep reflection. Uh, so this is also in my reading uh, deprecated, and we should be, or we are discouraged to do so by introduction of the uh, module system. Yeah, modules. Uh, modules are everywhere, as some say. Of course, they are in JDK, in JVM, and so on. But are they so popular in libraries and applications? As Kai Ho Horseman. Uh, wrote, wrote in his book, uh, modules are kind of a social experiment. We don't know if they're going to become popular in libraries, in our applications. Sure, the JDK is modular, and there's no way back from that, as far as I can tell, but uh, will our apps and libs uh, become popular? We'll see. Uh, why they introduced modules in the first place? Because of the jar hell. Because if you had the long class path and you swap the uh, two uh, uh, jars having the same class, uh, then you had this conflict like method not found or somebody installed this jar in Tomcat or JBoss or Wi-Fi or whatever, then, you, n then you, like, you had this in one environment and you didn't in the other. This was the jar hell, like DDL hell or, or whatever other hell. And there's also better encapsulation, uh, meaning that this that they are trying to get uh, us away from this uh, deep uh, reflection. And this is, again, just my reading. It's about moving from class path to module path, which is easier to maintain once you have proper modules and you'd like to run JLink and stuff. Uh, so now you can repeat after me for the second time, because many people say that in Java 11, to run an application, you need to have modules in your code because Java is modular, because Jigsaw was introduced in Java 9, it's like that, blah, 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 rubbish. So you can repeat after me. In Java 11, you don't need to have modules and module path, if you wish. It's not obligatory. But JDK is modular. There is no more this rt.jar file, OK? There are just modules. Uh, so migration steps. The first migration step, optional, but I recommend it, is installing SDK man, uh, just to uh, you know, jiggle the versions of uh, JVMs and JDKs you have installed. Then you should upgrade your IDE. Then you should upgrade your build tools and continuous integration like uh, you know, uh, Jenkins, Hudson, uh, Team City, whatever you're using. Uh, then if you have any containers like Tomcat, uh, for example, or, or uh, Wildfire, whatever we have these days, you should upgrade them as well, uh, because uh, like Tomcat 9 supports, uh, like every version of Tomcat 9 supports uh, Java 9 and above, and from Tomcat 7 and 8, you need to choose carefully uh, the version you, you're using. Uh, I, I know it's like many people say, oh, okay, we should just go with Tomcat 9, it's, it shouldn't be a problem. I know where you guys uh, are working because I work in such environments sometimes as well, uh, meaning that we can't upgrade any piece of stuff uh, we would like because it works, right? So don't touch it. So sometimes migrating to two versions above might not be possible, but migrating minor version with just barely, but it does support Java 9 and above might be enough. So uh, you should upgrade, and we should upgrade uh, these containers. And of course, we should upgrade all the dependencies. They are not always in POM, sometimes in Gradle and, and, and uh, SBT or stuff, but uh, we should upgrade them. And then we should try 
while we compile it still as a target version 8, we should try running it as a version uh, on JVM maybe 9, maybe 10, it depends, but alwa also always as a version 11. I mean, this is the target version, okay, and the source version, and we try running it using 11. Sometimes when you have these uh, SOAP stories, web service stories, it might be worth uh, running 9 and 10. <coughs> uh, and for this decoupled stuff, like Java SE, EE, uh, we should add explicit dependencies. And this uh, is a very important step, step. This test and automate really do it like crazy in each step. Like if you're going to go like Java 9, 10, and 11 and stuff, automate this stuff. Why? Because of this, you know, instant loss of support, for example. Or this will ease further migrations because from now on, Java is removing stuff. So if you don't want to repeat this testing again and again with each upgrade, like 11, 12, 13 in September this year, you should have this automated, right? Not just manual tests. This will like, be a huge benefit in the future. Extra migration steps are like this. We may try to compile this as 11 and try running as 8 to see if it works. Because sometimes when you own everything, you own the code, you own the platform, uh, because you're running as a SaaS or whatever, uh, then you're safe. I mean, you can do whatever. But I can do the same thing because we are also releasing the, our product in like, as in like a good old days. I mean, uh, we have to uh, compile and create this single Uber jar file which can be downloaded by people and has to be runnable for Java 8 and 11. And in case you are in this situation, you'd like to do this step as well to make sure that even if you compile with Java 11, it will still keep running using Java 8. Uh, and uh, of course, we, you might play with this illegal access like debug, deny, we'll get to that. Who has seen this uh, illegal access detected warning already? Uh, not so many people experimenting with Java 11. Uh, and to get rid of these warnings, of course, there's this add exports, opens, and reads uh, various flags to, to the compiler and, and, and JVM. Uh, two things might happen. Of course, many more might happen, but these are the most important ones, I think. Uh, missing class and illegal access. This can be missing something, class, method, whatever. Uh, if you have missing applet or corba, then I'm really sorry for you, but no way to upgrade, I think. If you are missing anything from Javax, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's still going to be kept, kept as Javax, uh, you know, because of this Java EE slash Jakarta EE uh, story we had a few months ago. Uh, but anyway, if you have, like, in still in Java code, Javax uh, uh, something uh, from this package, like class or whatever, uh, there is this brilliant post from Nikolai Padlog. Uh, explaining uh, what dependencies you should add to your Maven or Gradle to make it uh, run, I mean, pass the build and, and run in the production again. Uh, if you have missing classes and methods, I mean, the compiler complains that, whoops, look, sorry, there is not such class, or you get the class not found or method not found exceptions, it means that most probably you haven't upgraded your dependencies because Trying to run an application still using Hibernate 4 using Java 11 might not be the best idea, shortly speaking. Uh, if your DevOps teams or administrators or even you uh, see that Java is complaining about some missing XX parameters, you just need to get a list of this uh, removed stuff to see how to replace them if they're still used or not, uh, and how to upgrade your scripts. Uh, illegal access, so you have so seen this illegal access, yeah, so even if you're not using modules, you don't have this module path argument uh, when you compile uh, the code or when you run Java, uh, you will still see or might see uh, these illegal access warnings. It's because our applications, our libraries might not be modular, even not automatic modules, but still JVM under the hood is already modular, okay? De facto, all of the code, the, I mean, even if you're still using just a class path, everything you have in a class path becomes a huge implicit um, module called all unnamed. 
So we have all the modules from Java and just one huge pile of something module of your code. Okay, so there's also th this, th what you have in class path is always a module. It's called all unnamed. And if it gets an ac illegal access, uh, like uh, trying to reflect something on reader private methods and stuff, it will get this illegal access warning. Uh, so, and this is the default one. Uh, it's called illegal access permit. And I think it's like your friend's option because when you do something bad, your friend will just tell you, okay, I think you shouldn't be doing this. Right. So it will complain just once, saying your application uh, has an illegal access somewhere in the code. This is a friend option. Then you can have this wife approach. Every time you do something bad, Java will tell you that. You're having illegal access, you're having an illegal access, you're having an illegal access. Every time you do this in your code or your code does it, then you'll see a warning. Then you can go the mother in low option. Not only it will tell you every time you do or perform an illegal access, it will also show you exactly where it happened uh, because of the stock trace, okay? And finally, you have this father-in-law option, I call it. Deny means you can perform an illegal access, but only once. It will show you where, and then you're dead. And the worst thing about this is just there's a kind of a thread or a promise or whatever we call it from the uh, creators and maintainers of Java, broadly speaking, that one day this will be the default one. Not the permit, not the friendly option, but one day if we don't add this uh, all reads, all, uh, add reads, opens, and so on, if, you, if we don't migrate to f this fine, nas uh, sorry, fine uh, shining and so on modules, we will get this illegal access deny and our code will no longer work unless we configure it to do so. Um, <coughs> yeah, and to configure it, I mean, to get to read, uh, even if we don't have these modules, as I told you in our code, if you don't have module-info Java files in our jars, uh, compiled into module.info.class uh, files, then we can have this add exports, opens, modules, uh, reads, and patch modules uh, options. Uh, then we tell Java that, okay, uh, our all unnamed module, meaning the class path, can access uh, like instant uh, private fields uh, of uh, JVM class and so on and so forth. So this is the way to like uh, uh, pimp it uh, because, as I told you, all class path jars end up in all unnamed module. Okay, so when you do Java dash dash list modules, maybe we can do that. Why not? Let's see if we can. Yeah, let's see. See Java, uh, but this is Java eight. So here, uh, just check version. Yeah, it's eleven. It's outdated, by the way, but. We'll do for the demo. Uh, so Java list modules, if I remember. Yeah, so these are the modules. You see, this is the list of the modules. And uh, your module would be just uh, this uh, all unnamed. And imagine there's this, uh, this is this uh, one of these uh, thoughts experiments. Uh, imagine this huge module graph. So the modules are, you know, having dependencies on each other, and also your module has dependencies on all the others. And if there's this illegal dependency, illegal access, Java complains about that, right? So to get rid of these complaints, we need to use these options during the compile for Java C and for Java. <coughs> this opens uh, this package from this module uh, to another module using reflection. Uh, I mean, this is for deep reflection. Uh, this is, I'm skipping the slides because I have some code to show you. So I think it's better to, you know, focus on the code than on the slides. Uh, so there's also add exports. Again, so from a module, we have a package which will be uh, exported to another reading module. And uh, then uh, we might need to add some modules. This might be also a nice, an, a nice option to use even for Java 9 and 10. I mean, you don't, if you have uh, this enterprise edition uh, code, like this uh, JAXB or activation or whatever, you might not want to jump to Java 11 right away. You might need, to, you might want to go with Java 10 uh, or 9 uh, and just add uh, these modules explicitly because they are still present there. Uh, in Java 9 and 10, however, they are disabled by default. So this is the way to enable them. 
uh, as written in here. Uh, yeah. And uh, on reads, so a module can read, so some targets can read a module uh, and uh, patch modules because <coughs> one of the benefits or effects or whatever we call it, one of the properties of the module system is that using it, we know exactly which class belongs to. I mean, there is no option to have classes from a single package to spread among two or more jars anymore. This was the jar hell. With, uh, if you have module path and you use Jigsaw properly, then uh, each, uh, each uh, package needs to belong to exactly one jar. You can have two jars with the same package. So if you happen to need some monkey patching or something, uh, then this is the option, like uh, patch module. So then we tell Java or compiler, OK, so I know that this module consists of two or more jars. OK, don't worry about this. This, this is why we use patch module. Uh, OK, and you know, if you have like uh, add reads, add opens, easily the list can get like two or three screens. It's not unusual. It might happen. So how do you do that? Do we keep this long list of, of these parameters? It's not needed, in, uh, of course. You c we can just add them to option files and just, it's, uh, and just uh, use them as parameters, just like this. Uh, option file one, option file two, and so on. It can be Java or Java C. S for example, this might be for one library, this might be for another library, or one product, and, and depending libraries, whatever we, uh, schema you choose. Uh, one thing, they can't, ne can't be nested. I mean, they need to be flat files, just like you know, the options in the previous slides. Important thing when it comes to migrating is that your millage of each and every one of you might vary. OK, so I migrated two uh, applications to Java 11 after convincing the business. Uh, and we had such and such issues and such and such classes missing and so on and so forth. But for your products, your systems, your applications, this will be different, of course. However, the schema is more or less the same, I think, especially for backend. Uh, if you'd like to see a trivial migration, the code is on GitHub. So we can clone it, fork it, or whatever. Uh, let's run it here. Uh, all oh right. So this is a s this is just an artificial application. I wasn't able to show you a real one, you know, NDA and the stuff. So it, I kind of distilled uh, what happened uh, and created this simple demo. Uh, this simple demo, <laughs> just like the most of our application, doesn't do anything serious. It just exists. Uh, so we have just some some uh, some pojos, uh, Alice, Bob, and John. They are family, as you can see. And then we are creating XML out of them. And we are like we might be sending this XML to an external system or using SOAP or whatever. Then we can uh, use uh, Base64, uh, for example. And this is just this application. I mean, nothing fancy. However, <coughs> when we try to compile it and run it. Is this this window? Nope, this one, I think. Oh, yeah. This is, by the way, how and why I recommend, sorry, uh, Leah, uh, using um, using uh, SDK uh, manager. You see, oh, uh, maybe I use uh, the mouse. Uh, see, uh, just here, I'm. this is uh, my alias for checkout, so don't worry, I'm just checking out the tag Java 8. And this is the easy way to uh, switch or swap the version of Java you use, you're using in this very shell using SDK manager. Uh, and then I'm just running Gradle cl uh, clear and run, so let's run this application. <coughs> This is a message from uh, SDK, uh, SDK Manager. And, s and as you can see, the compiler warned us that we are using some uh, internal proprietary API and may be removed in future release. And in fact, it got removed. But we got this warning. Let's say we disabled the warnings, because we can. And we don't see an, any warnings in our Jensen or sorry Jenkins or whatever. And then this is the output meet John. As you can see, this is uh, just this to string method. And he, here we have this XML. And here we have uh, encrypted uh, base64 name uh, of John. And the actual character array inside this string is J O H N. 
Uh, we can see it here. See, this is this, where was this? Deep reflection, deep look into. So we have this deep look into string. You guys see the code, right? Okay, it's okay. So uh, I'm just opening the declared field called value of the string class. Uh, I uh, make this field accessible. As you can see, this is the deep reflection. This is the daemon. You shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and then we get this value field from this input and we can print, and after casting, of course, here we can print it. As you can see, here's the character array, all right? So we are using for, for John, we are using, in the, we have uh, four characters, meaning eight bytes, okay? Now, if we switch to Java 9, and uh, Java 9, another comment. And you can see here how easily I can switch to another Java version, like uh, in here. See? Just SDK use. If it's not installed, SDK man will download it for you and uh, enable Java 9 in this, uh, in this terminal window. See? Java version. Now it's 9. It's so easy. Uh, the output looks more or less the same, except we don't have this warning here. And uh, now we have bytes in this string, not characters. So this is, in my opinion, one of the arguments to convince the business. If you happen to process a lot of strings, and many of our applications just do that, uh, the transferring strings into strings, you can convince the business that the application will use half of the memory for your strings if you're using, of course, Western characters. Um, so let's take a look into the code. <coughs> let's take a look, uh, a look into the code. Uh, here I had to use another method because that, that previous one was, uh, was removed. So I had to update the code here. And see here is a casting to byte array, not character array, because they changed the implementation of string. And to make this work, I had to pimp up the Gradle's build a little bit. So for compile Java, I had to add this Java XML bind. See this add modules. If I don't do that, let's pretend I don't do that. So uh, let's do the just Gradle clean and build. Build failed because these modules are still present I mean, the XML classes are still present in Java 9, but they're not enabled by default. We need to enable them with these add modules. And if we get rid of this illegal access, uh, uh, sorry, this tuning that opens, because from um, our code, we are taking a deep reflection into the string, right? Uh, so let's, rem sorry, let's remove this column as well, and let's run it. Now it should, oh, oh sorry. Uh, now it should crash with something different. Um, see, illegal, illegal reflective access made, and this is this debug option, this mother in law. Uh, so it will tell you where exactly it happened. So you ha performing an, uh, we are performing an illegal access to the value of this string in, uh, in uh, here. This is what it, it's telling us. So to get rid of this warning, like I know what I'm doing, we need to pimp our Maven or build or whatever, or Gradle build, or uh, ideally we should get rid of this uh, illegal access, okay? Uh, or deep reflection, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, okay, so let's switch to Java 11. <coughs> And again, the output is more or less the same. String still has bytes inside. Uh, so what has changed? Uh, see, I needed to add these implementations. Like, it would have dependencies in, in your POM file as well. Because there is no such module since Java 11 to enable to have all these Javax dot something, classes, packages, methods, and, and so on and so on. So uh, you simply need to uh, check what to add to have this uh, and to keep this running. Just instead of having this in, in Java, kind of embedded or itself, we need to add an external dependency. Um, and do we have any changes in here? 
No, I don't think so. So uh, there's uh, another thing I'd like to show you. <coughs> It's just this is like an, this is another application. What it does is also like not very important. I have just two threads: a consumer and producer thread. And the thing is that the producer produces much faster than the consumer. See, the producer sleeps only 50 milliseconds, and the consumer sleeps 100 milliseconds. So, what should we expect in this case? Any guesses? I still have some jellies. No volunteers. Of course, we'll get uh, out of memory exception. And, uh, but let's say we don't know uh, what this code is doing. We might not even have access to this code. Uh, it might be just an external uh, like uh, a library from an external pro uh, provider, vendor. Uh, so we don't have the code to, to trace it or to profile it elsewhere. So how we can do that? We can do uh, it like this. Let me show you the Gradle's build. As you can see here, I'm using this extend, uh, sorry, Java Unified Logging. So I'm telling Java Unified Logging, I want to log everything GC related in debug uh, in such a file. By the way, don't log to TMP, it's just for the demo. Uh, and this is the format of the log entry. Uh, and uh, uh, if after I, I uh, run this application, I get such a log. <coughs> As you can see, it's quite huge. Uh, let me decrease the font size, yeah. And you can see everything that happened with GC for this application. And it's pretty, pretty, pretty long because it's debug. But you can see everything that happened. I mean, every GC cycle and so on and so on. Okay, I stopped scrolling. Uh, there's another option to see what happened. And this is what I really guys recommended to you. There's another session on Java Flight Recorder. Uh, and if you're not using Java Flight Recorder, you th I think you should, because uh, of these options. Uh, sorry, not here, here, not here, S oh, here. W I am starting Flight Recorder. I'm recording. It's like a, in Polish, it's Czarna Skrzynka. It's like a flight recorder in the aeroplane, right? So we're recording how the plane is like going through the air and so on. So how it behaves in the production since takeoff till landing. So, and this is what we have in Java uh, 9, uh, sorry, uh, for sure in Java 11 uh, with OpenJDK as well. So we can record it to uh, disk, we can dump it on exit, and again, again. I'm not going to run it here. Uh, see, I'm uh, calling this application with some what is your password baby arguments. This might be uh, important. And I have just this um, file open for analysis, and this is how it looks in uh, Java Mission Control. I mean, you create this. Uh, recording using Java Flight Recorder, and then you can open it in Java Mission Control. And as you can see, it's already saying us that in this uh, automated analysis results, that Java application, there's something wrong with the th uh, threads allocating, uh, that the producer is creating most of the objects, uh, that the application holds way too many times because of the uh, GC, uh, that the free physical memory at the time was really low, and so on and so on. It, it's even so nice that it tells you that one of the parameters was password, and it looks suspiciously because you shouldn't provide passwords as parameters or as arguments to your application. It's even that good. And if you're interested what happened to this uh, garbage collector, you see a uh, nice charts, what happened, when, how long did it take, uh, some of pauses, and so on and so on. Uh, you have this TLAP allocations, uh, you have this exclamation mark warning for memory and life objects, uh, as you can see. So it's really nice tool, especially for DevOps guys, to see what actually happened, how this application behaved in the production in easy, nice, and, and graphical way. Uh, I think it's a bit uh, an, an easier and nicer than uh, analyzing or grabbing this log file. Okay? Uh, two more things. Uh, of course, there's uh, JShell. It might be nice and easy and handy for you because what we used to do, we used to write a lot of this hello world, like a public static void meth uh, main method and so on just to test anything or we are creating dummy J unit tests, okay? Now we don't have to do that with JShell, uh, so the file looks more or less like this. 
see, this is just a script. I'm using the var uh, here, so I don't need to write string one and so on. It's much faster. See, it's like just the content, except this ex exit. Uh, it's just like the content of this uh, public static void main uh, method. And uh, using JShell, uh, I can, of course, run it uh, in interactive mode, or I can feed this file to JShell to execute it. Um, see, so I don't need to explicitly compile the code. And what's even maybe nicer, uh, I think Java finally allows you to create JavaScript. Really. Let's take a look at this file. Does it look similar? Do you know it? This? Okay. Notice this line here. It's called Shebang. So if you have bash scripts or Perl scripts, you write here that this should be run as bash or whatever, right? Or as shell. And we can now say that this should be run as Java. Okay, source 11. And see what it will do. Uh, let me find the core. Yeah, see, I'm not doing any Java C. I'm not doing any Java. I'm just calling this script because it's exe executable. And it works. Of course, you, you should have noticed us that now Java supports Unicode much better. I mean, all these fancy emojis. Uh, and this file should be ex ex executable. And this is also an, an illustration that since Java 10, as far as rem I remember, uh, Java is uh, aware of these uh, constraints by containers and so on, so we can get in your Docker images and so on better uh, information, how many cores you have, what's the free memory, what's the limit, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, there's a lot of new stuff uh, really worth the, uh, the migration. If you like to have a better migration, uh, uh, do you know this uh, pet shop application from uh, from Spring, with Spring? Do you know it? Yeah. yeah. So you ca there was one guy who created this uh, nice blog post migrating this application to Java 11. You can read it. It has Maven. Uh, if you'd like this talk, you can have uh, training with me. I have uh, training uh, about migrating to Java 11, all the good new stuff uh, in, in Java versions 9, 10, 11, and even 12. Uh, there will be one in, uh, if you'd like to extend your Confitura, uh, during this Saturday, I have a training on Jigsaw on Sunday, and there should be something in Tree City Jack in uh, August, as far as I remember, uh, in, in case you, you, you live in, in Pomozo or somewhere in there. And remember, guys, always and for everyone, for every speaker, not only during this conference, but every conference, please provide your feedback because we value your feedback. Uh, using it, we can improve our skills, our uh, presentations, and using this feedback, uh, next time you'll get better speakers and better presentations. If you're shy, no worries. You can even handle a paper form as I was once given such a form. Don't worry, I even accept such a feedback. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this talk. I hope the migration will be easy for you. And this is the link to slides and the code, and we have two more minutes for questions, if you have any. Maybe I should move aside. Questions, comments? Shut it out. Uh, it, it, so the question is, should we not use the reflection at all? Uh, there, is a, there are two concepts called deep reflection and shallow reflection. So more or less shallow reflection is kind of a dynamic loading. So as you could have seen Mario explain that in a previous session, it won't work with Graal, for example, or not always work. And this is more or less pretty okay. It's kind of a dynamic and such stuff. Deep reflection, however, is kind of like, you know, Java is or is supposed to be object-oriented paradigm, right? So with this deep reflection, we are effectively destroying this paradigm. That's why, in my private opinion, it's just my opinion, Java is trying to discourage us from this. OK, so it, it, wasn't, it was never a good idea, in my opinion. Sometimes it was necessary by some tools. But now uh, they're making it uh, like more difficult to achieve or more verbatim, let me put it that way, if you do it. Half a minute for another question. 
Oh, this one. Uh, it's if the if I understand the question, uh, should we build? Uh, should we have a new build, like new jar? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question, so the question is more or less, if I read correctly, if I or if I'm already using some external dependencies and these are compiled jars, compiled jars, can I uh, use them or should I recompile them? Uh, you can use them as long as they are just normal standard edition applications, which should work. Okay. So if they're not using any removed API, they should work. Okay. We're out of the time. Thank you very much for attending this talk. <laughs> Thanks.